welcome to the Pickle Planet Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Jenna. And I'm Tosh, the other host. <laughs> and we are so excited that you are here yes. for this episode because this one... Oh my goodness, you guys have been so excited about this episode. It really, it's all about you. Jenna and I just have a list of questions right here beside us that, that were you sent, sent in. us. Yeah, and it, we're about to get down to the nitty gritty of it. Yes, yeah, so this is fair warning, whether you're watching or listening, mm -hmm. if there's other people in the room with you. Little people? <laughs> you may or may not want them to stay around for the this discussion. Depends on how open you are and what yeah. you like to talk about. <laughs> but we are going to talk about sex today. And we are going to talk about it in a very factual way. No holds barred. Um, very respectful and really interesting and I can't wait. Yeah, no, me too. And we've had a, a few conversations with our friend Bonnie Fisher before mm -hmm. and Bonnie Fisher is actually how we met Lisa Dawn Hamilton. Now, Lisa Dawn has her own podcast called Do We Know Things? And you will know things oh, yeah. when, <laughs> when you listen to the podcast. So Lisa Dawn, if you could just go ahead and tell us maybe a little bit more about the podcast and how you decided to do that. Sure. So I'm a professor and a sex educator and I was looking to start a podcast that would do sex education things to a broader audience. And I wasn't entirely sure how to go about doing that or how to do something that was different than what other people were doing. And how it actually came up for me is I was telling, or a, a student in one of my classes asked a question about something that I, it was one of those facts that I just repeated over and over again. And he asked a follow-up question and I realized I didn't know. And so when I went to look at the follow-up question, I realized there's all this information that I had been repeating that uh, that is part of sort of sex educator lore <laughs> um, that wasn't exactly correct. And so I started digging into how do we know things? Why do we think we know things? And that kind of how it started. It spawned, yeah, yeah, that's a really good idea. Yeah. It's a fantastic concept because I think you're right, there's so much that we, we think, oh, well, this is what everyone knows. Mm -hmm. This is what mm -hmm. we've been taught. But yeah, how often do we actually stop and go, oh, where did that information come from? Or where did that bias come from? Where did that assumption mm -hmm. come from that, you know, certain people feel certain things at a certain time or are going to react a certain mm -hmm. way to certain things? So yeah, yeah, it's a really fantastic podcast. And I find that even though we're saturated in sex all around us, we don't actually have real conversations about sex and, you know, what turns people on or what works for some pre people and not others. We have this idea of what we see that this is how it's supposed to go or this is how I'm supposed to look or these are the faces I'm supposed to make. Right. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> but whether or not that's real is uh, another story. Yeah. Well, that's what we're going to dive into yes. today. Exactly. Now, Jenna yes. wrote the questions down, so I'm going to let her read them <laughs> uh, because I can't. No, I'm just going to let her do uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I didn't write these for general <laughs> consumption. Yeah, they're just for her to these. read. Yeah. Um, and so these are all questions that people submitted to us when we said that we were going to have you on as a guest. So, Anonymously. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, uh, th there's kind of a, a wide range. I'm trying to figure out where should we start? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? Let's just jump right into the nitty gritty. I think it's a good I idea. Think, I think yeah. this one is very interesting and will really resonate with people. And I know it's a topic that you like to, to touch on. Uh, one of the questions we had was from a woman who said she enjoys the idea of pornography. She would like to watch, but most times she finds things very derogatory. And she feels like there must be things out there that are made for women who want to watch it. And so how does one go about finding, I, I don't know what the right word yeah. is, decent? Decent, <laughs> decent? Yeah. I think that's a reasonable <laughs> way to frame it. Um, there's a number of different ways to go about it. Uh, one of the things that I recommend is just even a basic search on ethical porn. Um, and, and you can search that and it will come up and there's different, usually it leads you to magazine sites that say, say like best places to find ethical porn. And ethical porn is usually made by the people who are participating in the porn, or at the very least, there are much more strict rules around how people are treated that are acting in the pornography. Uh, very often, it's feminist porn or porn made by women for women, and it tends to be different than the mainstream porn that you can find for free on various tube sites. And I think part of the issue is most people assume porn comes for, for free with a click of the button. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but if you're looking for stuff that will maybe be more focused on women or be less derogatory towards women, um, very often you're going to have to pay for that pornography. And so doing a search for ethical porn is one way to do it. Uh, another resource is in Toronto every year, they have the Feminist Porn Awards. And so you can look at who won the Feminist Porn Awards really? and they have resources and listing of directors. That's fantastic. Yeah. Because that's exactly how I go to like find movies I like. Right, right. right. Like, yeah. Won the award. Yes. What looks good. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and Erica Lust is a director who was someone who was involved in the porn industry and realized how harmful it was and decided to start her own thing that was respectful and did pornography that women would actually enjoy. Um, I'll also put a plug in for non-visual stimulation. So erotic stories, um, mm -hmm. I think, are highly underestimated. Yeah. <laughs> and there are, you know, you can buy them in book form, but also there's one website is Literotica, and it's just sort of like Wikipedia of erotic stories. Anybody can submit a story. Some of them are terrible. Um, <laughs> but you can search around for different oh, uh, yeah, yeah. categories. <laughs> and then that way, everything's in your head. So it's, for some people, a safer way to do it where you don't have to rely on what's going to show up on your screen. You can just make it all happen in your head. Yeah, and then they can look like any way you want them to look. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. yes. Little Jamie yeah. from Outlander. <laughs> 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 all right, I think that was a fantastic little It's a good to way to get in. into it, exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I think maybe flowing from that pretty easily then is, so if you're in a relationship and one partner feels like they want to introduce pornography or other interests, other things, what is the best way for someone to approach that? Mm -hmm. It's a tricky question because I think sex, even in long-term relationships, can still be a bit of a minefield for people to talk about if it's not something that they usually talk about. And one of the things I often recommend for people is to say things like, oh, I was listening to this podcast oh, or... Oh, yeah. Blame um, us. Yeah. 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 Jen uh, Tosh told me to tell you. <laughs> it's fine. We'll never meet. <laughs> but it's a way, because often if someone approaches a partner just saying, here's something I'm missing or here's something... Sorry, I keep hitting my phone. Uh, so here's something I'm missing. Here's something that I would like in the bedroom often the person on the receiving end might take that as I'm inadequate, they're unhappy. Mm -hmm. And so kind of bringing it in as this, I know I heard this thing or I read about this thing or in some way um, that it's coming from outside of them is just like, this is something I'm interested in. Uh, but even that, even that saying that can be really scary for people because you're being vulnerable and opening up about your desires and People often are very judgy about sex things, mm -hmm. and so even, again, people in long-term relationships might immediately just be like, ew, what's wrong with you? Or why would you want that? I don't like that. Uh, and that is not an uncommon reaction. And so what I would encourage people, I guess, on the receiving end <laughs> to think about is just even if it feels terrible and you're like, this is horrifying, I hate you, or whatever the <laughs> feeling is on the inside, um, maybe taking a moment to be like, okay, interesting, I could consider this. <laughs> um, but in general, I do think it's a tricky thing to approach. Mm. Just like leave the literature laying around the house. <laughs> right, Just right. Like, <laughs> if you don't have kids in the house anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you have a safe spot to do that? Yeah. yeah. So in following up to that, we mm. had someone ask to, you know, what happens when you make that leap mm -hmm. of saying, I want to introduce this fetish or mm -hmm. this, you know, this element to our relationship and the other person does not mm -hmm. right. respond well mm -hmm. to it at all. Mm -hmm. Like very much is just not interested. Right. I think there's a couple ways to go about this. Uh, one is if the person sort of shuts down immediately and is just not interested in engaging, um, maybe taking some time apart and then broaching it again at a later time and just being like, you know, now that you've had time to think about this, um, could we talk about this a little more? Uh, but for some people, once they're rejected once, they just sort of shut down. Um, and that is a problem in any relationship if people feel like they can't talk about their interests and desires with their partner. Um, so my first suggestion would be to try it again later and just say, you know, I'd really like to talk about this. This is something that's really important to me or not even that it's important, but this is just something I think could spice up our sex life or whatever the interest is. Um, if it's something that for someone is a, a kink or a fetish that they really wanted to engage in for a long time, 
they could even frame it as this is something I, I've really been interested in. I've never really talked about it before, but it's something that's kind of been in the back of my mind for a while. Um, just sort of framing it as not a not an attack on the person, um, uh, or not a, a judgment on the person, but just saying, you know, this is about me. This is my interest. I'm hoping that you can hear me and like at least consider this. Uh, Dan Savage has a a phrase he uses called good giving in game uh, within reason and that mm -hmm. partners should attempt to be good in bed, giving in bed and game to try things in reason at least once. Um, but for some people there are th going to be things that are just a hard limit, like it's just not okay for them. Uh, one thing I will note that often in with people in kink communities who practice fetish things um, or kinky stuff often talk about when they, they were first approached by their partner, their initial response was, oh no, n definitely not. And then as they started experimenting a little more, they realized, oh, actually, I really, really like this. <laughs> or I may not like this particular thing, but maybe this other thing. Um, and so allowing, like just at least trying things um, uh, can be useful. Um, the last suggestion I guess I would make is considering the possibility of going outside the relationship if it's a monogamous relationship. So one of the things I study is non-monogamy um, and consensual non-monogamy, and that's something that's getting more and more attention broadly, I think. Um, the possibility of, you know, if partners can't meet specific needs, um, and it, you don't have to be non-monogamous just because your partner's not meeting your needs. There are multiple reasons to be non-monogamous, but if that is a specific concern, then potentially discussing the possibility of being able to go outside the relationship, maybe for that specific thing. Is there a particular time or a way that you would suggest people approach this? Uh, you know, I'm thinking someone might have it in their head, like in the middle of getting it on, they're like, hey, by the way. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, that was my thought. Yeah, yeah. don't do it then. Yes. Yeah. No. What, what advice do you have for someone in terms of preparing for that first conversation? Like when should that happen? Right. So yes, you are correct. <laughs> Definitely not in the heat of the moment um, because that can just throw things off. People are already, again, feeling vulnerable if you're naked and getting hot and heavy and then your partner throws this surprise at you. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Consent is a really important of or a really important part of all relationships, even if it's someone, again, that you've been with for 25 years, um, introducing something non-consensually uh, is still not okay. Uh, so I would suggest at a time when you're kind of relaxing for the evening, um, if kids are involved, kids are in bed, obviously, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so sort of your stresses of the day are, have been falling away, falling away um, and approach it at that point in time. Um, one thing I also recommend to people as a way of constantly checking in on the relationships, and I do this in my relationship, um, is have scheduled check-ins. So depending on the relationship, this could be once a month, uh, once a week, uh, and you can have set questions. So, you know, how are you feeling in general about the relationship? What was something positive that happened for us this week? What was something negative that happened? Um, how are you feeling about our sex life? Uh, is there something you need or if there's something you're interested in trying? So setting up a framework where it just is part of the relationship. So um, I think about this, a lot of people do budget check-ins, right? So right. you do your budget check-in and then you do your relationship check-in. Um, and so that sets up a way where it's a non-threatening way to approach these things if it's just built into your relationship that you do these check-ins on a weekly or monthly basis. It's a really good idea too because it, we need to keep in mind that we change differently mm -hmm. as like once once women have babies, our desires change or mm -hmm. our needs change or what have you, or, you know, you hit a certain age or whatever, your hormones can keep changing and you mm -hmm. have all of these, all of a sudden these needs that you didn't have before, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that, that doing that check-in would actually be a really great <laughs> idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it doesn't leave the burden on one person to have to awkwardly broach this topic that they've never talked about before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. It's like, yeah, we're going to talk every month, both of us, mm -hmm. about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Make so, it a date. Go over yeah. supper. Yeah, yeah. Talk about it in a public place. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're a really loud talker. That make it awkward. But, right. Um, so that kind of flows into another question that we had. Someone sent in a question and explained their relationship as, you know, they're committed couple, been together 22 years, married for most of that time, both in their 40s, 
she's experiencing a very high libido. He is very much not. Mm -hmm. She's tried to talk to him. She's tried to introduce different things to kind of get things back to, I'm assuming, where they used to be. Mm -hmm. And they just, they seem to be hitting this wall of not being able to understand why they're not in the same place. So what, what advice, what, what words of wisdom do you <laughs> right. have for someone who finds themselves, and I mean, this is a very specific, it's the woman who's feeling this way towards the man in the relationship, right. but I think there's probably a lot of relationships that get to that point of mm -hmm. one person has a high libido, the other doesn't, and all of these little, like, let's talk, let's try something new, mm -hmm. nothing mm -hmm. seems to be changing the situation. Mm -hmm. Well, d what we in sex therapy land, we call it sexual desire discrepancy, and it is the most common reason that people go to sex therapy, where one partner has a higher desire than the other partner. And so this is definitely not uncommon, uh, and especially as relationships shift and change, especially if you've been together 22 years, mm -hmm. um, there's gonna be ebbs and flows through desire. Um, usually at the beginning of any relationship, people have higher levels of desire, it's new, it's exciting, um, and then perhaps over time they settle into their regular levels of desire or wanting. Um, and so one possibility, if conversations with the partner aren't working, like if they can't figure it out themselves, is to go to a sex therapist um, or someone, a, a, any sort of therapist or a sex coach, someone who's uh, got expertise in this area. And another possibility is to, um, um, I totally just lost my train of thought. <laughs> it happens. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yes, go to a sex therapist. Um, another possibility is um, if it has been a shift that is dramatic, um, it could be a health issue. So we often talk about women's hormones shifting and changing um, and hormones absolutely can influence your feelings and desires around sex. Um, but for men as well, there could be a hormonal issue. And so if the person himself is, if he's not concerned about his lack of desire, then technically it's not a problem. Um, but if it was a, a sharp uh, drop off, he may wanna go to a doctor and get hormones checked, um, thyroid checked, those sorts of things. Um, but it could also be that there's something that, that the partner with lower desire wants sexually that isn't happening that maybe he doesn't feel comfortable talking about. Um, or it could just be some people just go get to a phase of their life where they're just not interested in sex anymore. Um, and that might last for the rest of their lives. It might shift and change. Um, it really varies depending on the person. And they say that too, don't they? That kind of like as we age, women get more desire and men get less. Or is that like another <laughs> myth, I'm, I'm right? Gonna go with that, that's probably a podcast topic. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, that is going to be one of the podcast topics on do we know things. Um, but there, yes, the general sense is that uh, women in their mid to late 30s going into their 40s tend to have elevated desire. I actually haven't looked into the research on that yet, <laughs> um, but that is my sense. Um, and then we tend to see a drop off of desire um, as women go through menopause um, on average. But some women find that, you know, post menopause, their desire goes up a lot because they know there's just no risk of getting pregnant. So there's <laughs> like, no consequences to having sex. And so they can really let themselves go. Uh, so so part of it can be hormones, but part of it is also, you know, the worries you have in your brain as mm -hmm. well. Another question that we had that I think is probably relevant or going to be relevant to a lot of people who listen and watch yes. our podcast yes. is, you know, you have a couple who have young children at home. And so, you know, the kids go to bed and you've gotten into your routine. That that's mm -hmm. when you have your alone time. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you have teenagers who are up <laughs> all hours of the night right. and can hear things yes. and understand And know what they things. are. Yeah. Exactly. And so we had someone reach out and ask for, you know, some tips and some thought and like, how do you keep having your healthy sexual relationship mm -hmm. when you've got teenagers in the house that you're trying to, I don't know if it's be respectful of or right. trying to avoid. Yeah, I'm, right. not, I'm not even sure because mine aren't that old yet. <laughs> yeah. right. But uh, I... I can see it on the horizon. <laughs> yes. I thought it was a very good question. 
Well, one great, great thing about teenagers is that they like to go out with their friends. <laughs> True. And so part of it could just be planning and sort of coordinating when the teenagers are out of the house. And usually you know when they're going to leave and when they're going to come back. Um, and if, if it is a situation where in the house there's really nowhere to have privacy, that might need to be the, the strategy is waiting for the kids to be out or um, making sure that they're in a totally different part of the house. Uh, even if they're awake, you know, if there's a basement where they go hang out with their friends, mm -hmm. they probably can't hear you if you're upstairs. Um, and with kids of all ages, I think it can introduce like fun sneakiness, um, you know, trying to be quiet, trying to, um, you know, do, do things that, uh, to make it, Make you feel like a teenager again. Exactly, yeah. exactly, <laughs> yes. Play up the fun of it. Yeah. yeah. Date yeah. nights or what have you, you might have to enlist different places besides the house. <laughs> yes, Yeah. that's true too. Yeah, you can just rent a hotel yeah. and go there for an hour or two. Yeah, they're teenagers, <laughs> they can stay home alone. Exactly. That's exactly. true, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, some of us don't have that option yet of leaving them home. <laughs> no, not yet, not yet. It's funny, I... Uh, we're going to wrap up here in a minute, so I think that's the last question we're going to get to, but it was funny. I saw a comedian on the weekend, and she is fantastic and hilarious and was talking about the fact that her children are now uh, teenagers and into their young adulthood, and she talked about how her daughter has moved back home, and she was like, going to be that cool mom, and, you know, <laughs> everything's great, everything's good, you know, you do you, you've got your room down here, whatever. And then the daughter was bringing her boyfriend home and having very loud, oh, fantastic. No. And the mother was so mad because she was like, I stayed quiet for 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> and it was so, I, I had already seen this question come in. I was like, oh my goodness, that's so exactly right. We spend so much of our lives, I think, having that, like, the kids can't hear yes. us. Mm. Yeah. Like, maybe the kids don't care. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah, that's entirely true. It's all going to come back and bite us. <laughs> yeah, <so>. exactly. <laughs> right, thank you so yes. much for taking the time to answer those questions because I think there is a lot to think about for people, mm -hmm. whether or not you know y you feel like everything's great in your relationship or not. I think there was a lot of really good information there about just how we should approach these kind of conversations. Especially, they could come up in the future, yes. depending mm -hmm. where you are in your relationship right now. Well, that's the thing. Like you said, things shift all the time. And it's great to know that there are resources like your podcast. And and I I have seen some sex coaches and some sex therapists mm -hmm. starting to, to trickle into the, the mainstream locally, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm, definitely. So if people have some questions for you, how can they anonymously ask you questions for your podcast? That's a great question. <laughs> Maybe I should set up my own anonymous Dropbox so I can put that on my Instagram at Do We Know Things. I'll set up another anonymous Dropbox. That's fantastic. Perfect. Thank you for listening and watching. Yes. And remember to do us a solid and subscribe or yes. leave a review wherever you listen to your podcast. Thanks so much.